Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Kaimana. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's Politics of Work panel. Uh, so just to start us off, before I introduce our panelists, I'm going to uh, provide a brief description of uh, what this event's going to be about. Uh, this is the uh, same description that was used by the panelists to sort of structure their introductory remarks. So yeah, just to um, provide a little intro. So um, since 2020, there has been an upsurge in strike activity alongside transformations in the way we work. This has created new opportunities for organizing, but also brings up undigested history about the ends of the labor movement. On the one hand, workers are organizing for better working conditions. On the other hand, COVID has accelerated technological change that threatens to undermine their job security. How does labor organizing relate to the broader project of the left and of human emancipation? How are the interests of labor and technology related, or potentially at odds? What are the politics of work? So I will be moderating uh, our panel this evening. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists in order of uh, speaking appearance. Uh, so they'll each have brief 10-minute uh, introductory remarks uh, and then the opportunity to respond to the other panelists' um, introduction. Uh, and then we'll get into the Q&A. So to start us off with, uh, um, John Laville is a professor of sociology at Westchester University. Anna Pugsley Coe is an organizer with the Saturday Free School here in Philly. And uh, Ved Dukun is a rail worker and member of the International Association of Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers, as well as a member of the Socialist Workers Party. So, start us off, John. Okay, I really don't know where to begin. It seems like we have a, a quite a, a diverse kind of a panel here, right? With, with three different kind of perspectives and uh, ideas and the like. So, um, so let me just throw some stuff out there. Um, let me just say a word about my background, and we can talk a little bit about um, um, some 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 general concepts, and then uh, then I'll come back to talk about labor in particular today. Okay. Uh, um, uh, I'm a professor in sociology at Westchester University. Um, uh, I've been there for many years, uh, um, um, and I. I, 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 I uh, I've been involved in, in my personal life and, and various kinds of union activities, you know, faculty union activities. We, I, got, I was part of the organizing graduate students when I was a graduate student many, many years ago, one of the early graduate student union organizations, right? And I've been involved in various kinds of social movements and protests all the way back to the, to the 1960s and 70s, right? So, right, you know, uh, up, up until including Occupy Wall Street and that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah, but, but really, I'm, I'm a professor, I'm an academic, right? And, this is, and I teach social theory and political sociology, and this is my major focus, although my earlier focus was on, on the history of psychiatry, right? which I think is very much related, believe it or not, right? Uh, but um, that's my background. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me start off by mentioning um, uh, a couple things related to uh, uh, Marxism, my Marxism, right? Um, and I suspect that a lot of people in the crowd, or at least some people in the crowd, might, <coughs> might, might, might take exception to this because I think there are a lot of people in the Socialist Workers' Party in, in, in the crowd, and, and, and I don't take an orthodox view towards Marxism. Right? Uh, my, my perspective on Marxism, you could call revisionist or, or neo-Marxist or whatever, right? It's really in the lines of the Frankfurt School tradition. I'm very much in the line of the Frankfurt School tradition if you extract uh, Freud from that tradition, right? You got you, you basically got my ideas, right? Um, you know, Marx graft, uh, grafted on top of Weber, or vice versa, and on top of uh, a Gramsci and the like, right? So, so it's not an orthodox kind of perspective, okay? Uh, um, and, and, and towards that end, and, and, and related to that, uh, the reason that it's not orthodox is that that you know I, I really think that 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 the, the fundamentals of Marx, I think, are, 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 are right, right? Uh, the materialist framework, right, focusing on classes of economics, right, focusing on, on all the, the myriad problems with capitalism, I think this is fundamentally right. But, but when you look at, at the particulars of Marx's argument, I don't think they hold today, right? I, that the class concept, the class conflict between labor and, and capital, particularly between the proletariat, the industrial working class, and the bourgeoisie, I, I don't think is applicable today. I think we need to rethink the, the, where the conflict is going to arise, right, that's going to bring down capitalism, because I think capitalism needs to get brought down, right? Uh, it's just a question of you know, how and why this happens, right? And I don't think a traditional Marxist framework uh, gives us the tools to, 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 to allow us to understand that. Right? The factories are all closed, right? <laughs> this is, uh, so, 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 so I think that we need to reconceptualize where the, what the conflict is and, and where it's going to arise. Right? That's my fundamental take. Right? 
And towards that end, I think I, 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 there, are three, there are several fundamental concepts that I think we need to understand if we want to under, try to tackle the contemporary world, capitalism, and try to figure out how do we get out of this. Right? You know, how do we go beyond this? Right? How do we overthrow it? Right? One of the ideas is relationships, relations between different groups, entities, and everything else, or relational kind of understandings, which is very fundamentally different than the, than the dominant way of understanding the world. Right? If you, if you know about philosophy, you know, process philosophy is sort of like what I'm thinking of, right? Um, um, also, values, has, I think, has to be central to an analysis, right? Values oftentimes get extracted from a, from a Marxist analysis of the world today, and I think values need to be front and center, right, into the world. And the last thing is instrumentality. So this echoes Frankfurt School, echoes Weber, right? And when I talk about instrumentalities as a fundamental concept, and this is, I think, the fundamental concept that we need to <coughs> grasp if we want to understand the tensions in the world today, uh, we're talking about, you know, basically a modified Weberian kind of analysis of, 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 of formal rationality or instrumental rationality, lining up means and ends in a logical way without considering values, right? This is the dominant way of, 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 of life today. Right, instrumentalities. Right, it shapes our, our individual being. Right, it shapes our ways of thinking and our being. It shapes our organizations. Right, it saturates our existence. Right, and and of course this is on this is this is produced and nurtured and supported by capitalism because the capitalist logic is is instrumentality. Right, right, right. And I think this is what we need to approach. Right, right. this is what we need to tackle. Okay, all right. <coughs> And so, 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 having said that, th th what I think is the fundamental tension or conflict in society is not between labor and capital in the traditional Marxist sense, right? I think it's the, it's the conflict between values, particularly human values, right, and instrumentalities, right? Capitalist instrumentalities, right? And, 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 and so, and, and I don't think it's going to materialize, if you will, between class conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, right? Partly because the class conflict, uh, you know, it, 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 it doesn't seem to be uh, applicable to the world today, right? The, the proletariat, in Marx's view, is the industrial working class, right? Where, where, you know, and, and anybody who thinks that the industrial working class in America is, is, is the largest class or the, or the revolutionary class or whatever, it's, it's, it's not there, right? Uh, you know, you can try to force fit, you know, the, the poor, poor classes into this model, but it doesn't really quite work, right? The whole notion of class, the way Marx defined it, you know, in terms of ownership of the means of production or not, um, that needs to be rethought, I think, if we want to understand it, right? You know, Eric Olin Wright, the Marxist Eric Olin Wright, says that we need to identify class in terms of ownership over, over the means of production and control and, and everything else, right? And I think he's on the right track in understanding that class needs to be reconceptualized, right? And we can't force fit the, 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 the world today into this proletarian bourgeoisie model, right? Um, and, and, and so, 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 I, I, so that's just one thing. Right? Okay, so in terms of the politics of work, specifically related to this issue, the question is, you know, what do we do with labor unions, right? Labor unions, of course, are the, are, are the center of Marx's analysis of, of capitalism, right? They're gonna, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna rise up, right? Uh, but, you know, what is the nature of unions? The whole idea of unions also has changed, mm. right? Right? You know, for Marx had this vision of, of unions being defined by terms of labor versus capital, right? Private sectors, right? And factories and the like, right? Right? But here, if you think about unions in America today, particularly, it's not based on industrial workers and private sector, right? You're talking about all different kinds of workers, right? The biggest sector of unions today, right, are in the public sector, right? Right, it's a, you know, it, it's a, it seems to be force-fitting the model to say that it's labor versus capital when it's when it's postal workers versus the state, right? Uh, we need to reconsider, the, you know, these concepts and ideas and and, and and understand, you know, where the where the conflict is going to arise, right? Um, and, and, and so so these are just some of the ideas, and then. Just a few other little ideas related to unions. Another thing about labor unions is that there's a tendency of labor unions, even today, to focus on instrumentalities, right? To focus on self, uh, rational self-interest, better pay, better welfare. Better, you know, I would suggest that that's part of the problem, not part of the solution. I'm not saying that unions should not do that, right? I'm not. It's common sense to do this, right? 
But I am saying that, that unions should be focusing on, on broader issues, right? They, they, the trans union activities, right? You know, it's hard in the United States because there are laws meant to, you know, prohibiting this stuff. But this is what neat unions need to be. They need to be more assertive, right? They, they, they need to go, go beyond the traditional. They need to focus on, on empowering people, right? They, they need to focus on, 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 on things like morality and, 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 and orienting workers to have a, a sense of self-empowerment, right? rather than, 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 than focus only or exclusively on, on rational self-interest, right? And, and I think this is, because when, when, when unions focus on rational self-interest to the exclusion or to the, the, of these other things, right, they, they, I would argue that they become part of the problem, right? They're just a cog in the machine that keeps the machine of capitalism going, right? 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 Um, so, um, but, so let me just wrap up and say a couple other things. There's some main themes that I think that, that should be noted, right? Uh, instrumentalities, of course, that I just mentioned. The self is also a major theme that I didn't really, I haven't talked about at all, but the, the, the changing historical context of the self, right, and self-identity is very important, I think, in a Marxist kind of framework, right? And, 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 uh, and, and this relates to the idea of identity politics and everything else, right? And if we have more time, we could talk about that. But I think the self, the notion of self, historically conce conceptualized self, right, uh, uh, is, a part, is a big part of the issue that's going to going to propose strains on capitalism, right? And then um, and the morality and ethics, right? I think a big gap in, in Marxist scholarship. Right? And people might disagree with me on this, right? It has to do with morality and ethics, right? I think, I think the, there has to be a more of a, a, more of a full blown morality and ethics kind of perspective developed by, by Marx's framework. Right? And I think without that, it's going to, be, going to, it's going to still wobble a little bit, right? I mean, that's, these are just some of my thoughts, right? I can end there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Anna. Um, I'm from the Saturday Free School, and I guess similarly, I'll just start with, um, I guess, first of all, uh, a little bit of where I'm coming from, and um, about the Saturday Free School first. So I actually started out as a student organizer. Um, well, I, I, I was actually first politicized when, back when I was in middle school. Um, during Occupy, that's how young I am. And um, yeah, I continued throughout high school and then I would say um, another period was when I was a Penn student. You know, I came through Philadelphia Public Schools and then I was a Penn student. I joined a bunch of groups. Uh, there was Penn Student Power, which was for schools. Um, and then the big one that I joined was this group called SLAP, Student Labor Action Project. Um, that was a big thing in 2019, and it was actually the third iteration of the group. So in our iteration, we were focusing on um, the dining hall workers at Penn Campus who had already been unionized as a result of the efforts of the first, iter uh, the first iteration. And instead, this time, we were focusing on getting them pay raises and to address a lot of the abusive uh, conditions that they were working under. Um, so that, that happened in the spring of 2019. In the summer, then we had a reading group, a SLAP reading group. We read Grace Lee Boggs, and we, we were really curious about uh, ideas. I think it was something we had felt was really missing in the work of organizing was ideas. There was so much focus at least I think in our view on blind action and almost dogmatism, that we wanted to get back to ideas, questioning what are our goals, why are we doing what we're doing, uh, questioning a lot of the paradigms that I think we had come up under. So from that actually came a group, the, from the reading group over the summer came a group called Lotus Collective, um, where we continued a lot of the ideological work that had been started by the SLAP reading group um, the SLAP group itself, to the best of my knowledge, fizzled uh, in the coming semesters. Um, I think a lot of that was accelerated by the pandemic, uh, remote learning and all of that, which, um, which, I mean, I'll get to some of that later. But the Lotus Collective at the same time got joined up with this organization in North Philadelphia called the Saturday Free School for Philosophy and Black Liberation. Um, 
a lot of the mentors who had brought us up ideologically within the Lotus Collective had been members of the Saturday Free School, and from then on, we became linked up. Um, I guess you could say we, we, we engaged, in, we were a part of the Free School umbrella, and I think a lot of the work we did, ideologically, the study and the action, was focused specifically on student consciousness um, and a lot of issues that were specific to young people nowadays. So that's a little bit of where I'm coming from. The Saturday Free School is, um, was without going into <laughs> too much, it's based in North Philadelphia and its focus is primarily on investigating, I would say, like the logics and the idea and the ideas of revolutionary movements, revolutionary change, um, and is rooted in the traditions of especially Black America, Black Philadelphia, and a lot of socialist re um, revolutionary movements around the world. Um, it's located, yeah, in North Philadelphia, and I guess to address some of the uh, some parts of the prompt. Yeah, I'm also just going to be throwing a bunch of ideas out here. But yeah, this, this actually made me think a lot about the initial questions that have been raised as a result of the SLAP reading group, the SLAP organizing, and the subsequent Lotus Collective. One thing that we noticed was that although the workers had been unionized almost 10 years before uh, this iteration of SLAP, their material conditions had changed uh, in almost no way. In fact, in some ways, they had deteriorated. Mm. And we wanted to ask some of these fundamental questions. What is the essence of unionizing? Why is it, why is it that unionizing is oftentimes the first line of action for workers um, who are dealing with oppressive conditions? Um, how has unionization changed throughout the centuries? What did it represent? for example, in the 1930s through maybe the 1960s, and what does it represent now? Um, what is it capturing? Like, what does it capture among the people who are part of unions and who aspire to be? Um, I think a lot of questions that also came up, you know, during and after the pandemic, we've been seeing a lot of, I think especially young people join unions, I would say, especially in coffee shops, you have Starbucks, which is the big example. But then more interestingly, you're seeing them in like independent coffee shops, like lots of small independent businesses, um, workers are unionizing. And it says something very specific, I think, about the condition of young people and also the condition of work. Um, I can elaborate on this later, but I see it partly as an attempt to... Uh, it's, it's an attempt, I think, first to offload a lot of political energy, uh, pent-up political energy that's a result of massive disappointment and failures within the past 10 years of political movements. I think in many ways they're super let down by Occupy with the election of Obama. Um, they were super let down twice in a row with Bernie Sanders. Um, I mean, I was actually someone who came out of the Bernie Sanders movement and was let down by it. And I think that raised a lot of fundamental questions and contradictions to the surface. So you have this going on. I think also it shows the failure of identity politics that was really uh, rampant in, I would say, the late 2010s to explain uh, conditions and to provide a clear solution. So... Yeah, I, I guess I'll start there, but there's obviously so much that can that that came up when I saw this. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. My turn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak uh, tonight. My name is Ved Dukin. Um, I am a rail worker. Uh, and a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Um, and um, I just wanted to share a little bit uh, my experiences concretely that I think in 
reality addresses the question of why I think what Marx and Engels wrote in 1948, 18. 1848, did I say 19? <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Tells you how relevant it is. <laughs> uh, 1848, 175 years so years ago, how relevant it is today that the history of all hitherto existing society is a history of class struggle. Um, and I think that is, that is the fundamental contradiction that we have to resolve living under capitalism today. Um, having gone through uh, the most recent example, all of you which probably have been following, the uh, rail workers fight, um, where what we've been confronting in the last 10 years in the industry has been a relentless drive by the rail owners, rail bosses, uh, to, as they drive to compete amongst each other, to, they've cut the workforce by some 30% in the last 30 year, 10 years. And the result is a consolidation of, of, of jobs and, and basically speed up an intensification of labor. Okay? Fewer workers working harder, longer, faster. Uh, myself, I work in the yard in South Philadelphia. Um, and I work up to a minimum of 50 to 60 hours a week. Um, there is one of the big issues that we were fighting through the contract uh, was to address these conditions. We, ne we wanted more time, more time off to have a life to have a family life, to take care of yourself, to be human. The bosses refused. Uh, the Biden administration imposed a presidential emergency board that proposed what he called, considered a, a good deal for rail workers, which was to give us, uh, impose three days that you could take without penalty for doctor's visits. But here's the kicker. You had to schedule these 30 days in advance, and you only can get them on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Okay, I, I, we'll get into how this crazy this is. In addition, they gave us one more day, one more off day that you can take without penalty. Right now, you can't take time off without penalty. You will get penalized, and that's how they drive us this way. And this is what rail workers were fighting to change. Okay. We rejected the, the PEB that was imposed. All, in our majority, we rejected it. 115,000 rail workers rejected it. The Biden administration said, you're going to suck it up and you're going to take it because in the interest of the economy, you have to keep working. Well, it tells you a lot about what you're confronting today. A government that acts in the interests of the very wealthy capitalists. Uh, and why the struggle by working people will continue uh, to unfold, like many of you have mentioned. The strikes that took place coming out of COVID and during COVID, the bosses used the restrictions and the lockdown to impose draconian work conditions. In a lot of the factories that went out on strike, the workers who were working, they wanted to impose seven day work week, 12 hour shifts in contract. This is what the work week was going to be. You could think about that. That's 96 hours minimum a week. They wanted to impose it, but they couldn't. What happened? Workers decided to fight back. Okay, and they went on strike. A lot of them do. They continue. Um, but it, it, the, the imposition of the contract on rail work was very instructive, I think, because it showed uh, that both parties, Democrats, Republicans, including the Socialists and the Democratic Party, voted to impose this contract on rail workers. Okay? It tells you a lot. It's, uh, it, it, it poses the question of what do we need to advance the interests of working people. Okay. Um, now, 
it is, it, I know it got reduced to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm spending a little bit more time because I am a rail worker and I think it makes the case more because a lot of people don't know what really the conditions have been uh, in rail. And having gone through it, um, it is not a, it is not a uh, foregone conclusion that this is the be all and end all because the struggles continue. Um, and they come in the form of different, different ways. We are still fighting for better conditions on the job. It's, it's, it's through these struggles that workers gain confidence in our capacities as workers to fight. Uh, we see the possibility to transform the unions uh, today because that's the only way uh, to, to change our conditions. We club together, we come together because you realize your power is in acting collectively. Okay, These are the, this is what is unfolding everywhere. The experiences that we go through as working people, the conclusions that we draw from these experiences of how to transform, how to change things, what do we do to, to make it different. Um, and it becomes clearer what we are up against. We are up against the government, we are up against parties that represent uh, not our interests, they represent the interests of the very wealthy, the owners, the owners of, of, of industry, captains of, of capital. Um, okay. Uh, at the same time, there's a dangerous thing that's also happening that, that we have to be, take, take heed of. That is, there's a concerted effort to attack the constitutional freedoms that prevent working people from being able to organize and fight. Uh, you saw this with the, the recent FBI raids that took place. Uh, no matter who it's targeted against initially, whether it be a former president, professors of Asian, of Asian descent, uh, rail workers, whoever it is that it is targeted, it will ultimately be used against working people and the attempt to refurbish the Federal Bureau of Investigation as being mm -hmm. the force that will maintain state control. That's what's, being ha that's what's happening, that's what's being prepared. If you look at the budget that's been passed by the Biden administration, the amount of funding that they are getting, and how there has a, there's a history of using the FBI to go after working people and as struggles unfold to prevent the independent organization of working people and and the possibility of something different taking shape. They fear what working people can do. Okay. Um, and I think there's, there's serious obstacles to the developing of class consciousness, working class consciousness. That is essential uh, for any successful fight for liberation, period. If you look at history, this is, this is what it shows. Okay. I'll just end with this, a few things, and many of you are probably aware of. Uh, the conditions that working people are confronting today. Okay, um, real wages continue to decline. Inflation uh, and, and real wages adjusted for infl inflation has not risen since the 70s. Birth rates are falling. Life expectancy in the U.S. has fallen to 76 years. That's the lowest in more than a quarter century. Okay. Some of this, these are the conditions that continue to grind uh, against working people and we try to find ways, workers try to find ways to, to resist. Um, it's important uh, to keep spaces open uh, for discussion and debate. And that's one thing that you see on campuses that is being shut down, right? Under the guise of identity politics, wokeness, whatever. This is a danger. This is, this is an affront uh, on, um, uh, against uh, a materialist view of the world and understanding contradictions and how history has transformed and what we, what we have today. So this, this um, I'll, I'll end with this, okay. Uh, January 1st, 19, to this year, uh, marked the 64th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. Um, and why I raise this? Because it's a very concrete example of what I think uh, you have to look at if you want to try to address how 
to change capitalism because it can't be changed. It has to be thrown into the dustbin of history, which is why the Cuban Revolution is so feared for the last 64 years, because they showed what working people can do. Capitalism can be overthrown. A, s a society that's based on different morality, different values, can be built based on the organization of labor in a different way. Uh, and the United States you, is determined to crush it, its example uh, to prevent people from knowing the truth about the Cuban Revolution. And it's why, why I think it is an example uh, that we uh, defend uh, and call for others to get involved in demanding the restrictions and, uh, on, on, on Cuba be lifted, including the economic embargo, which makes it so difficult for them uh, right now. To end, uh, I think the solution uh, is what working people have to fight to take political power in the United States. I believe that a workers and farmers government is the most powerful tool that you can wield to address decades and, and centuries of oppression, be that black, for the fight for black liberation, the question on the fight for women's emancipation, um, that's the most powerful tool. And there's two examples that you can look to, is the Cuban Revolution, nor was accomplished in the Russian Revolution in the very initial years that was led by the Bolsheviks and Lenin. A particular party, you need an instrument uh, that can lead a fight for power. And that's what we want to do, and what we, I encourage you to become part of, to learn about as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I will be giving our panelists uh, five minutes to respond to each of the other panelists' introductions. So starting with John. Um, yeah. so just could, want me to just comment on what was said? Sure. Okay. Um, I can comment about a couple of things that I just said. Um, one thing was, I guess, uh, as a professor, I, I can tell you, you know, uh, I, I've been, I was censured the, the last year uh, by my, the president of my university and by the provost of my university for daring to criticize Trump in my classes, right? It's like, it like crazy, right? It's like, because students and the student faculty parents complained to the, 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 the administration that I was criticizing Trump in, in my lectures on political sociology. <laughs> It's like crazy. It's uh, just going back. So there is a concern. I'm, I'm very, as a professor, I'm very concerned about the silencing of the pro uh, academics. Right? It's really, it's, 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 it's a, I, I think it's a serious concern, right? In, ter in terms of so the other stuff about the about labor, you know, I, I support unions completely. I, I'm a big union supporter. I, I don't think that they're going to be the vanguard of the revolution, however. I guess I just don't see that in America. Right? I guess the, 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 the conditions are, aren't right for it. I mean, historically, it's, it's, it's not right for it. Uh, the, 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 the very notion of what I talked about before of class being, uh, you know, uh, being, you know the, the, it, 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 it has to be reconceptualized and everything else. Unions have to be reconceptualized. I, I don't think that you know that, that labor is going to be the, the, the force for the revolution. I think that that, that it's important for for unions to exist and for championing the the, the rights of workers. You know. And the like, I think that's really important. But um, 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 so that's just a couple of my comments. Um, actually, I was, yeah, I was thinking about this idea of you know uh, a revolution. What kind of revolution does this country need? And um, yeah, I well, I want to say that I agree that as Americans, we are uh, due for one soon, and. <laughs> Well, and but but the thing is, is that I think it's it's such a it's, it's such an Amer well, it's it's such a uniquely American thing too because while we have a lot for sure as Americans to learn from the Cuban Revolution, from the Russian Revolution, I would also add from China um, and many other socialist countries. I mean, well, countries aren't, maybe aren't always socialist, but that we nonetheless have so much to learn from what they've built um, as an alternative to capitalism. I would also add that Americans have a lot to learn from our own history, that many of us either don't know or that we have not learned properly. Um, I think, you know, we've, in this country, we've already had three revolutions. The first one everyone knows about in 1776, which was a revolution. Um, 
For all its contradictions, it was an anti-colonial revolution and one that fundamentally defined the United States as a distinct political entity and its people to be, and, its, and the nation to be imbued in you know, democratic values. You know, th I, I would say the second revolution was um, the Civil War and the Reconstruction period when this contradiction of slavery came to a head and the United States had to literally go to war over the question of unity and over the question of slavery. Um, and, but I think the, the, the last revolution that we had was, I guess someone called the Civil Rights Movement or the Black Freedom Movement, um, which, you know, from the 1960s and the 1970s. And I think that's the one that's gonna be the most relevant to a fourth American revolution that, <laughs> that inevitably will come up in the coming years, decades, we don't know when, but, but, but the conditions are ripe. And yeah, I think especially you know, from Martin Luther King Jr., who was, I would say, the architect of a new American nation and who really captured the spirit of what America can and should be. Um, yeah, I just wanna emphasize that this country has its own revolutionary tradition and that while we can and should look to other countries for as examples of having built you know, societies and economies that are revolutionary, we also have a lot. And I think the people of this country have inherited this, this history and can just, just as much have the capacity to build on it in new and unforeseen ways. Um, well, they, uh, yes, I, I agree that there is a, a very powerful revolutionary history in the United States that tremendous attempts are made to prevent you from knowing the truth. Uh, to rewriting history and not knowing from the point of view of participants what really happened. When you refer to the civil rights movement and the civil rights struggle, you always are drummed into your head that it's Martin Luther King. That's the association. Whether you like it or not, that's... But it was, it was far greater than, than him. It was a movement that was based on working people. That's what it was. Martin Luther King was tipped by E.D. Nixon to lead the civil rights movement. By the way, he was the tenth choice. Not the first. They needed a charismatic leader at the time. But what was the basis of it? It was the unionized workers who are black that was the bedrock of organizing the Montgomery bus boycott that came on the heels of Emmett Till. Right? This is a lot of things they don't teach you because these were ordinary working people who decided to become part of something far greater than themselves and change in the course of the struggle. That's the road to transformation. That's the road to people's consciousness being changed to a different morality that's based on solidarity. Well, yeah, that's why they don't want you to know about it. But it, it, everything gets diverted into the two-party system. Everything, every movement, right? It, and there's disillusion because you think, well, no, that's because you have illusions in reforming what it is. And they try to prevent you from knowing the class difference, differentiation that's taking place. And it's class against class. That's, that's the motor force that will change. It's not around race, not around sex, not around... It's going to be class against class, and that's the battle. That's going to be the battle. Okay, that's how I see it. There is going to be a third American revolution, I believe, third. And it's going to be a socialist revolution. The, the thing is, it's, it's, you have to call it for what it is. Okay. Uh, that, that's the thing, you know. You, okay. We are fighting against capitalism as a system. Malcolm X was the best on this, I believe, because he explained the reality and the truth of how capitalism works. 
why he was feared so. Because he was driven and he saw the examples of, of the anti-colonial struggles around the world and how it transformed the human beings that he came into contact with and the impact that was going to have on his people here. He was moved by that and he saw it. He saw what revolutions could mean and what it could be. And he sought to unite with those forces that were willing to fight against this horrible system regardless of the color of your skin. Well, that's a pretty powerful example, but what do you learn about Malcolm X? Well, he was a racist. He was, he was anti-white. Oh, nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. But you, you have to go and read what he said. Read what he said. Read what he was fighting for. You'll be blown away because this is a product, a revolutionary in the heart of U.S. imperialism and it tells you how the conclusions that ordinary people can draw and become as they become engaged in struggle. That's the example. That's what they don't want you to know about. But how we can act, how we can fight, they always point to something that can change it. You've got to vote for the lesser of two evils. Hold your nose and vote. Hold your nose. Every time. How many times has it happened? Okay, everyone's living generation that can vote. But every time you go to vote, you hold your nose and you say, I'm going to vote for the lesser of two evils because the boogeyman is worse. Well, something happened in 2016 that got them really frightened in this country. Working people rejected the system. I don't care what you say about it. The conditions that working people were confronting, nah. We want something different. Bang, the system stopped working. It's not supposed to do that, right? So anyway, they're dealing with that today. That's what they're dealing with. They don't have a confident course to address the declining rates of profit, except to come after those who make and produce profit. That's social labor, that's working people, that's where they make profit from. Automation's not going to do it. It's a fantasy. The industrial working class, the working class is key. And you saw that how they fear, I'll just say, uh, how they fear the, uh, rail workers. They're so afraid. You saw the power we had to shut down the economy. Right? That's what they didn't want us to do. But that's a right we have to fight for. Okay, to address the last question. Sorry. He, um, uh, the, the, um, the, industri the working, working people will not be. Uh, it won't be labor unions that would lead. Yes, it w I don't believe it will be. But working people in their millions will become active and involved. You haven't seen anything like this. The closest you can come to is the 30s in this country. Or look at what happened in the civil rights movement. When you talk about mass movements, that's what you don't see today. But when it starts to happen, everything becomes transformed. Everything changes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll be transitioning into uh, our Q&A section. Uh, I'll just go ahead and take um, raised hands. I'll just point you out uh, in the crowd directly. So go ahead and raise your hands. Uh, right. Danny, you want to start us okay, off? I'll break the ice. Sure. <laughs> That's okay. So I think there is a, a, a question of kind of the specter of politics of work here. Meaning, I know Marx and Engels were mentioned a few times, and what stood out to them about the proletariat was not that it was working class, by which there's always been a working class. There's always been paupers, there's always been exploited people, there's always been oppressed, there's always been rich and poor. But that the working class had organized itself into a political movement, and especially it was unemployed people who were actually politicizing society. Meaning they couldn't sell their labor, they couldn't realize, as you were mentioning, their value. And yet they had democratic rights. They were proletarian, citizens without property. And I feel like that's the kind of specter in the background, because the way in which they could justify their rights is that we've partaken in developing this world, and this technology seems to be kind of replacing us and doing the opposite, right? It's not freeing us from drudgery. It's making us work harder, right? In other words, um, you know, Ben, you were talking about 50 to 60 hours. And probably some of that is even intensified by the fact that you can run multiple trains through the technology itself, meaning they can exploit people even harder. 
And it's raising that question of the crisis of society, of the society based on labor, by which I'm glad you brought up America, because maybe America was founded on the question of labor from the very beginning. And yet today we have unions, we have unions go on strike, and that kind of qualitative leap doesn't seem to happen in the way that it did happen at certain times in the 20th century, that it looked like unions organized and they raised the necessary next step of a party, and then I raised the question of the state, and all of a sudden you're in October 1917, right? And that question seems to kind of like be blocked. And even when work is discussed today, it's either discussed as, oh no, AOC betrayed us, by which she, she didn't, she's a Democrat, she did what she was gonna do. Or there are people who have lived through the kind of experience of Bernie Sanders or Occupy, and they're reflecting on the millennial left and thinking, why didn't this happen? Let me go join Starbucks or join Einstein Bagels. I'm gonna salt myself, I'm gonna proletarianize myself. It's very much a repeat of the 70s, right? Going to the point of production. And so I guess I'm asking for all of the panelists, and I would like all the panelists to respond, uh, is what do you think is missing that is kind of preventing I mean, you could just say a party, but that, that's kind of do sex mocks and not like, you know, like explaining what's missing. But what's kind of blocking people from politicizing labor in the way that it was done in the past? Or just politicizing society, meaning, meaning maybe it's not going to take the form of, oh, we're like the serfs and they're the lords, like the opening you know, lines of the Communist Manifesto. But just a mass movement that is actually politicizing the crisis of society, which is really what proletarian meant for Marx. So, that's for all the panelists. Would like to start off? I mean, I can make a couple comments. I don't know if this addresses your, your point, but when you're talking, the first thing I thought of, I, I thought of a couple of things. I thought of the history of unions, right? And then I thought of uh, uh, the shift from the industrial to the post-industrial society that we live in today. And, and I think you need to consider both of those if you talk about the, the role of unions in, in, in affecting any kind of change, right? I mean, and the history of unions, particularly history of radical unions, as I suspect most of you, most of you guys know, right, has been one of a, a radical a, a repression, right? Right. The, the Knights of Labor got squashed, right? The, the Wobblies got squashed, right? The Communists and the CIO got squashed, right? Anytime you know radicals, you know co communists, or, or you know they, they, they assert themselves on, on, on a national scale in, in labor unions and, and throughout the history of America. They get squashed, and it's not like you know, mildly squashed. They get big time squashed, right? Like you know, they get chased out of the country or, 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 or killed, right? Right? And so, so it, you know, you're working in a context in America, which is it's not really easy. Right? First of all, for, for radicalized labor unions to arise and to assert themselves, right? And you know, even mainstream unions, you know, have difficulties doing this now, right? So I'm not saying I, I don't. Want, I'm not saying that we should. They shouldn't try to be radicalized, and they shouldn't try to assert themselves. I'm saying they should, right? But I'm saying we, you got to recognize the, the context that we're, that we're operating within, right? right? Uh, and then the other thing is this, this shift from the industrial to the post-industrial. I've mentioned this a few times. The whole notion of class has to be recon reconceptualized, right? Uh, you know, and, and, you know the, the labor unions were, were bigger and stronger in, in the 1940s and 50s than they are now. And the, most of the unions, as I mentioned now, are, 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 are public unions, right? And so, so you know, the, so the idea of, of, of unions being the, 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 you know, I, I, and again, I su fully support unionization. Don't get me wrong, I fully support unionization. And particularly, I'm, I'm encouraged by the unionization of, of the low end of the service information sector, right? Because right now, the fundamental the tension, the gap is between the service sector, low end and high end service sector and information sector, right? And, and the low end service and information sector, Starbucks and, and the like, right, are, are unionizing more, right? And with SEIU and a higher, uh, very, very smaller unions, right? And I think that's a good thing, right? But, but I, I remain pessimistic that, that, this, that this will be, the, the, in any sense, the vanguard for revolutions. And related to that is, going back to what Ted was saying, I, 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 the, the notion of self and how self, how our individual selves exist is fundamentally different today than, than 100 years ago and 200 years ago. And I think that fundamentally changes labor, right? Uh, identities, you know, self and identity, right? The, the self has been disembedded from society. It's like a, it's a floating self and looking for an anchor, right? And, uh, and, and oftentimes the, and today it's, it's anchored in, 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 in identity politics, right? right? Race, class, gender, sexuality, whatever, right? Uh, and I don't think that that's something we should necessarily run from. I think we need to reconceptualize how it's been played out, right? I, I think that that may be a, a, a point of, 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 of organizing and, 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 
and, and, and, and formulating an opposition to capitalism. Right? And I, I know that didn't answer your question, Dan. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, would other panelists like to respond to the question or comments here? Um, can you just like, repeat the final part of your well, question? Well, I, I guess, it, well, I'll have a slight response to this, which is that we did have nurses' unions and we did have like all sorts of public unions that in a sense were politicizing what it did mean to work and what kind of society could we have on. So I don't always think that the industrialization thing necessarily answers it. And we've seen other parts of the world industrialize as well, like China, Vietnam, et cetera. In that sense, so it's not like those questions have just kind of gone off the, the map there. But I was kind of asking that, you know, at least from the left perspective or from the Marxist perspective, the interest in unions was basically that they were the working class organizing itself speculatively to take power, right? Like that was the point. In other words, that they were going to politicize society based on how they were going to organize society. Whereas today we get unions, we get the we get disruptions, we get <coughs> people who salt themselves, they go and proletarianize themselves, but we kind of don't get that anymore. And I was asking if people had any thoughts on why that might be blocked. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, you okay. can't go ahead. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, I don't know if this captures like the entirety of what's going on here, but I think one reason is that I think a lot of the script that uh, unionization is taking right now is almost copied and pasted directly from the model of what was progressive in the 1930s or even throughout the 1950s. But the fact is that conditions have changed drastically since then and they're not applicable anymore. I mean, on the one hand, I mean, you have in like the 1980s, um, you have like the, you know, World Bank and all of that, they, they decide to transition to like a financialization stage. I mean the I mean the kinds of jobs that like are privileged are just so different. I mean among all these other things. And it's just that unions have especially the leadership, I want to emphasize like the leadership really have not captured the fundamental concerns of working people. It's not that the working people aren't or can't be the vanguard, but their leadership is not um the, their, their leadership is not, is not real leadership. Because I think if you look at a lot of the union leaders, they basically take the exact same political positions as like the elite. The, a lot of the elite academics, a lot of the elite corporations, especially like with regards to, uh, I guess you could say like race and gender issues, not in that way, but you, I mean, you see, for example, like they take views that are very, have been imposed top down on, you know, I think a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement have kind of ended up in that direction. You see a lot of their views about um, like gender and sexuality, a lot of views. I mean, I think it's very obvious that a lot of the leadership through the positions that they've taken have actually showed contempt for the people that they're supposed to represent. <coughs> And working people know that. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think in terms of real working people's expression of their aspiration, I think in many ways you see it in ways that you, places you would not expect to find it. I think interestingly, the Trump movement has um, more authentic expressions of American working people and their aspirations. We might not agree with a lot of what they're saying, but and it might not be the most articulate expression, but the fact is, is that it's authentic. And it's being, I think, pretty viciously shut down and pre being pretty viciously attacked by the media. You know, they're being smeared as fascists, as white supremacists. Um, a lot of these words from like the 1930s, like fascist, is being taken completely out of context to describe like unemployed people or people who are part of the working class. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know, yeah, if that answers your question. Could I, could I respond? Um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. I guess I want to make a comment about this fascism, you know, uh, the comment. Uh, um, uh, I, I disagree with that. Uh, 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 
Um, I, I know quite a bit about fascism uh, from my, my studies, and, 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 I, and, I, and I teach it. And, and I, I would suggest that, that, that Trump, the Trump movement actually embodies many, many, many tr fascist sentimentalities to it, right? And so I would just disagree with you on that. Um, well, I don't think there is a fascist movement today. I think it's an epithet that's used to characterize working people, the deplorables. Every time you hear that word, think about the working class. That's who it's aimed at. When they talk about Trump's base, what's Trump's, what, is it, what does that mean? Trump's, who are they talking about? They're talking about working people. They're talking about a class of people in their majority who, who survive by selling their ability to labor. You go for the highest bidder. You band together to change conditions. That's the working class. What's the biggest obstacle to the working class taking political power? Well, it's leadership. Uh, there's not enough struggle yet. That's generalized. That's broader. That, can, that will develop over time. The workings of capitalism will ensure that. The question is, there will be revolutionary struggle. There will be struggles of all kinds. It will be, it will be, it will, it will come. It will come. The workings of capitalism will ensure that. But the question is, will we succeed? Will we succeed? You look at, you look at all these mobilizations that have taken place around the world, from what they call the Arab Spring, to every country where there are massive mobilizations, from Hong Kong to, I, the list gets longer and longer because it's a world crisis that we are facing today. But none of them, none of them went further than they could. Why? Because the question of leadership. There is no revolutionary leadership today. That's what has to come. That's what has to come. The experiences of the working class. Uh, and, okay, the, the thing about, uh, I wanted to say something about the, the unions. Um, yes, you know, the, the unions are not as strong as they once were. Uh, and in fact, membership is declining, has declined. Um, and in part because they have been co-opted as well. The leadership since, since, since before, the, before the 30s, leading up to World War II, that's actually when you saw the FBI's role being enhanced to smash independent labor organizations. And the furthest that we came to the kind of class struggle leadership developing in the working class is an example that took place in the 30s that was led by the Teamsters during the Teamsters fight. But they had to smash it. And that's when they went after, uh, they went after the leaders of, of the Teamsters and the FBI on a seditious conspiracy. Whenever you hear conspiracy, you know they have no proof and they're going to set you up and you're going to do time. <laughs> That's what happens. That's what it means. Conspiracy. Conspiracy to do what? Did you see what happened in Michigan? How they got these guys? I mean, they're serving time. For what? For thinking about doing something that they never actually did, that was infiltrated by FBI informers up, up and down the line. But they got enough to make it stick, to make the case that the Trump people, okay, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. This is what's happening. The question of, of defending democratic rights. The Constitution. This is important for working people. The laws that we have won through struggle that enable us to fight more effectively. That's what's coming under threat and is being led by the Democratic Party, the Biden administration, his Justice Department, the FBI. Okay. Um, anyway, the unions Will, will, the union, will the union movement be, be the vanguard of a revolution? No, it can't. That's not its purpose. It, is, it comes about because workers are trying to fight to change their conditions, economic conditions. But they can be transformed to become different kinds of instruments that take up broader questions. Like you saw in the 70s and 80s when the labor movement was moving, there were broader questions that workers were involved in to extend solidarity with the struggles in South Africa, to extend solidarity with the revolutions in Nicaragua and what was happening in, in, in Central America. This was possible. This is the American workers were taking positions. This is what we're saying is that it's possible. You can't... You, 
I'm very optimistic about what, what is going to happen. Because you start, if you start to look at the working class that way, as being the makers of history that can transform the world, because we are the ones that make culture possible. We are the ones that make it all happen. Without working people, you've got nothing. If we decided to strike, you had nothing for Christmas, let me tell you that. <laughs> because we would have shut it down, and that's what they're afraid of. Our power, and for us to realize that, that is the beginning of, of, of change. But it comes through experience, it comes through organizing to fight. You have to fight, have to fight, and you fight in our interest, and that's what they don't want you to realize. All right, um, let's see here. Right here. I got a question more related to like. Could you speak up a little bit? Uh, I got a question more related to like unification of workers versus like division of them. For a lot of people, if they hear Marxist, any kind of Marxist theory, they're immediately going to shut down any conversation about it and not want to hear whatever's going to come next. And at the same time, there's another facet where they're more struggling because they don't have time to read deep Marxist theory or really any kind of social theory. How do you branch those two together? To so they are the workers, they're the ones they're talking about. You know, I didn't, I didn't connect up. Let's do the frame. Right between this. Um, would any of you like to respond? No? I'll leave it to the, 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 the union guys. The, 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 the union guys, <laughs> okay. I mean, you can I'll respond too, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's open. <laughs> I'll take it, I'll take it. That's a good question, I think. Could you uh, repeat the question? I'll ask the gentleman to repeat it. Yeah, um, talk more just workers as a population. There's a lot of the pretty deep division between those that, when they hear Marxist or hear any kind of socialist or anything relating to those theories, will immediately shut down any conversation about it and don't want to talk about that because they already know the response to it. They know exactly what need, like, they'll reject it as soon as they hear those terms. And then on, on a separate facet, there's people who are just struggling to survive that don't have time to really indulge themselves in any kind of like social theory or any kind of economic theory, the chains that bind, like that, that sort of thing. So how do you bridge the gap between those two? My answer would be move to Europe, right? <laughs> in Europe, you know, it's not this antagonism towards, towards Marx, right, and Marxism, right, mm -hmm. in the working class, right, historically. You know, in the United States, of course, it's deeply entrenched, right? And and and, and how do you how do you get beyond that in the American context? Again, I I I defer to defer to the guys. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you from my experience what we do in my party. Okay, we have some of the publications in the back that take a look at. But as part of our activity of how we try to reach working people is we go to where they at. We go and knock on doors and we talk to people. And we introduce ourselves for who we are. Rail workers who are socialists and or, 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 or talking about building solidarity with struggles that are unfolding. And it doesn't matter what, what y we have no preconceived notions of who's going to answer the door and what they're going to say. And one thing that we find is that workers want to talk because of what you said, the conditions that working people are experiencing today want to talk about it. They don't care what you are, whether you're socialist or, or whatever, but they're interested in the ideas. That's what is beginning to open up, which is what is starting to change in the working class. There's space that's opening up to have discussions. You can't start with categories, right? You know, because you're a Marxist or... Whatever. The main thing is, you, you try, you, you, you find solidarity mm -hmm. with what somebody's going through and you can talk about that together and what we can do to change it. That's where we find a receptivity. They might not be a socialist and say, I'm, you know, I'm, and in fact, the better discussions we have with people who say they are Trump supporters. Very interesting case. Because they, they do. They, they, are, they are interested. They want to talk. And that's, that's the key, is, is being able to have a back and forth, a discussion, a debate. Not shut it down because you disagree and call somebody a homophobe, a racist, whatever that might be. 
That's not the road to building a movement and breaking divisions and uniting working people to fight. Okay? And that, that's, that's the key. And, and, and that's where we find... So, in order to understand what... It, it's not about dwelling on your oppression and exploitation. Working people know this. Like what Malcolm X said. It's about trying to fight for broadening your horizons. Because you want to understand how to change the world, you start to reach for books, ideas, very important. Well, they're starting to ban certain books because it's not politically correct. To Kill a Mockingbird is on the banned list. Can I, oh, the list goes on. You, why? Why? This is crazy. But it is, it stems from the insecurity of a class under capitalism who behold into the system uh, that, that are trying to, to cancel people for ideas. And, and that is, has to be fought against, you know, because we need space to discuss and debate and, and build a movement this way. Now, would you want to? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, obviously it's true that like, like the legacy of McCarthyism has done a number on, you know, these things, but I think, as, as you were saying, it's fine if you don't use the word socialism um, or these things in, your, in discussions with working people. And I think I would also push back against like, the assumption that like, working people are too tired to discuss ideas or theory. <laughs> um, in fact, I think the Saturday Free School really tries to capture that spirit of the, you know, the, the fact that there has been a tradition in this country of working people studying and being involved in ideological exchange with people both in this country and around the world. And, you know, pe I mean, yeah, people are thinking, people are studying, and um, I guess, I guess, wait, I guess like you're saying, how can you like reconcile the two? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like conversations, like, I agree that it's probably the best way to open dialogue about it, but there's definitely a lot of people right now that are, like, they'll get off work and just immediately go and watch whatever news station they decide they like the best, and then go to bed, and that's five, six days a week, that's what they do. And then people our age who will just get home, go on social media, and kind of feed into the conflict, the algorithm, like, that's just... Well, I mean, I guess to, idea. yeah, to address that, I mean, it is an issue, but I think that's, I think that type of... I'm trying. I'm, I'm looking for the word, but that type of. I don't know. My purpose brain. wasn't to say this is how like all. Like, no, no, no I know, but this but type of I don't know, maybe like brain deadness. That, but it's something that's been imposed on people. It's. I don't think it's something that is inherent to people who are tired or people who are going through a lot. It's something <coughs> that's been imposed. I think. I mean, as you said, especially on like on like our generation, but. I, but it's it's very obvious, at least from my experiences, you know, working with students, working with, you know, organizing with workers, that people can and people can and are capable, and they want to work with ideas. Um, and I, I guess the other thing I would say is there are so many uh, American leaders, you know, again, who do come out of working people that actually have in the past grappled with Marxism, with socialism, with all of these things. And I think they've, they've synthesized them uniquely to an American context. Uh, I would say, I mean, sure, like Malcolm X, but King, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a great example of someone like this. And I think you can say that many Americans, regardless of their race, regardless of their class or where they're from, I mean, King is someone who's almost universally admired today, or respected at least, taken seriously by Americans. And I, I really think it's through, you know, examples that we've already had in this country and through engaging, you know, who they actually were as people, their role, um, how they were made as leaders, you know, and their, their, their dialectical relationships, I think, with people is how, yeah, I think, I guess is if your question is addressing like raising the consciousness of people. Yeah, how do you have these conversations at times as well as going forward? 
Can I follow? Can I follow up? Just for one second. Uh, I'm sure. Um, I, I, you know, I was thinking about your question. And for me, as a professor, it's somewhat easy. I, 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 mean, I, I teach at Westchester University, a public regional university, with an awful lot of first-generation students, right? Right. And, uh, and and I don't try to indoctrinate them in one any way at all. But but I do teach them Marx. Right? Marx has become a, one of the one of the canonical figures in sociology. Right. Before the 1960s, he was it was verboten to talk about Marx, and you know, but now he's part of the canon in sociology. Right. Right. And so so it's it's a standard practice for for, for sociology professors to teach Marx, and I do it in, in, a, in a full full way. Again, not to. Uh, indoctrinate them in any, any way, but to, to get them to understand what Marxism is, right, and, and that it's not the evil big boogeyman that people think it is and everything else, and, and sometimes they go home and then I get a, 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 compl a the provost complains that I'm teaching Marx or whatever, and I say, this is part of the canon, right, but, but uh, so, so in, my, in my sense, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier because I'm, I'm, I'm introducing, you know, students and they're, they're introducing it to their parents, basically, right? Um. We have another question. Yep, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right here. And then, yeah. Um, um, in a form of comment, if you think about it from 1917 to 1970, is 53 years. From 1970 to 2023, is 53 years. It's 106 years that the, that the development of uh, capitalism, and as Lennon said, is a high stage of imperialism after the 1895 conference. You had the Russian Revolution. You had the beginning of imperialism, finance capital, consolidation that uh, for the United States that started after, after the Civil War, uh, the Second American Revolution. And then you had the, 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 the first international crisis uh, in the world uh, and it reflected in the, uh, the stock market crash, which in 1921 was the lowest point of labor organization, but we began to see the fight of working people to confront capital on the, on the, United, uh, on the U.S. continent uh, in the 19, late, uh, after the crash and through the 1930s, the consolidation of the industrial working class and the, 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 the unions who were politicized and came coming out of uh, the reform, of course, the CIO later on, out of the craft situation it was, and then you got the IWW and some of the labor unions coming out of the 1800s of civil war. Uh, and that was a big advance for the working class. The union, that unionization of industrial workers, the proletariat, who had to sell their labor power uh, coming in the United States. The first 53 years, the, the rise of big men. It took a million auto workers in the 1930s, uh, the general talked about the Teamsters, the others, to form the UAW. How did that happen? They <laughs> occupied, they, they stopped production. Uh, and then with the consolidation and expanse of uh, US capitalism in the world, and the, the mass labor movement uh, through the Roosevelt administration, uh, and, and then coming into the second uh, uh, imperial slaughter, the second uh, uh, world war. And what came out of that, the US became the top dog and the consolidation and then the co-opting of the leadership into the Democratic Party because FDR was the hero uh, and, you know, did all these things. I mean, we go into details about all that. And then the labor unions, because capitalism was able to, because there were I mean, labor unions and the militancy of the labor unions began to wrest some of the, uh, uh, the surplus value, the profit that the, that the U.S. capitalists were after their domination coming out of World War II. So there were concessions, but those concessions came at a price, consolidation of the leadership. And then, of course, the, the, the general already mentioned uh, the question of FBI. If you look at the history of the FBI, as a, it, at first it was that they used to be lawyers that served suits. But with Hoover and the consolidation of and what the US, uh, what the US government, capitalist government, against the independent organization of political will and movement of the working class that began to became the political police. You can look at all the elegant uh, movies and all that, but the Hoover transformed it with the, uh, with the backing of the U.S. ruling class. And that came when the black like unions and the Teamsters, uh, <coughs> other socialist movement, the Social Workers Party, victimized you know, for sedition and conspiracy for opposing 
U.S. intervention in World War II. And then coming forward after that, the fight in the World War II, and then the, the, what existed on this, on this soil was a system called Jim Crow, which grew out of the, 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 the end of radical reconstruction, coming forward, what was known as Jim Crow, which was a big division, the single division of working people in the United States. And it was a system that controlled the part of the, the, part of the working class African Americans, every aspect of our lives. There's a number of people in this room who uh, are old enough to remember uh, remember that or experience that. Um, and that for coming forward in that first 53 years, and then you had the rise of the civil rights movement. Uh, beginning actually, uh, I mean, even with coming back, the GIs coming back, the double B campaign. Uh, I mean, my father was in the military at that time, so I was able to experience that. that, that you, you had the, the GIs, black GIs coming up because it was all the same. We got to defeat this boogeyman, Hitler over there, and whatnot. Because well, hey, we come home, we're lynched. We have the system of Jim Crow, and there's much history actually coming up in the next this month and the next month. There'll be a lot of things about that you can learn about that. And then that was the the, the, the victory of uh, the civil rights movement was the single it was the single most thing that unified the U.S. working class in the U.S. history in that 106 years. It created that big division where for the working class was divided by the public in every aspect of our lives. You know, what time we had to get, I'm from North Carolina, what time we had to get home, off the streets, in the city I lived in, where you went to school, you know, where you went to Sears and Roblox, and you know, the, the, the color, Colored fountain and whatnot, and you had to be out of there by 4:30 before this thing. So anyway, there are many examples. That first first uh, 53 years, and that was a sink of the biggest mass movements. Uh, and as, as explained later, that's where that leadership came from. Sleeping car porters, the GIs coming back from from World War II, African American GIs, the Deacons for Defense. Uh, uh, and can go on and on about the different examples of this mass movement. Mm -hmm. And they didn't wait on the ballot. <laughs> That's what we fought for on the vote. That was the key thing that was explained about what's happening with constitutional rights. And, and Pennsylvania is one of the big things about voting rights. We can go on and on about that. They just started a meeting in Harrisburg yesterday. Uh, but that was the single most thing that unified the working class and broke down the biggest ambition in that, that, that first 53 years. And then you had to see what was happening in the world, uh, what the U.S. imperialism was done. Overthrew most of that in 1952. Uh, uh, the question of the Korean War and what the U.S. and then coming forward. I mean, the, the, the Vietnamese defeated the French in 1957. 54. 54, that's right. Well, what happened? You know, there was a, this anti coming out of the McCarthy period and this whole anti communism movement, and then the U.S. imperialists rationalized because they wanted to continue to control the Pacific. Uh, you know, they said, well, we got to go over here and defeat the, the, the National Liberation Movement of the Vietnamese, who just threw out the French. And that was part of the things of the, the domino of, uh, of, of uh, colonialism, African continent and Asia. Even, and then coming forward, the defeat of U.S. imperialism in 1975 in Vietnam. And that was a big turning point for U.S. imperialism. And you saw the downturn in the uh, economy, the other fights around the world for national liberation coming forward. And then, of course, we had the Cuban Revolution. Um, so if, if you think about that short period of history, in the history, 100, 106 years, what has transformed? And it, what has transformed that is the working people around the world and in, in this country, and they began to begin to contest capital and what that capitalism represents. Which of course Marx said came was created and came in with uh, creating this great thing because of what capitalism is. And uh, so and my point is that, that the optimism of what the weapon we come to is we look at when we look at ourselves, the person mentioned, I'll just wrap up, Malcolm X. The difference between Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King, of course, King was a left mass leader and how he became that and the civil rights movement, uh, which was already moving forward. But, but the difference was King thought, this, thought that capitalism could be reformed. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm X has developed and that. that. You thought, you, you Sorry. Follow, you, you follow Malcolm X and his development, where he came from and 
how what he saw, how he began to look at the world, is that a nationalism supported the Viet, uh, Vietnamese long before it came there. And it was a big support of the. We should have another panel on that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Can I just say something? Sorry, can Tony? Oh, yes, they, they okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't hold off until Do you want? Oh, well, we can come back to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We can, we can raise it as a question. Yeah. 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 Um, I was just going to make a statement. Tony is going to comment. Sure. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, so, would, there's a lot raised there, I guess, to sort of. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll take uh, right here. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so, well, I think one thing that is essential to any revolution is that it, it unifies the people. I mean, actually, I, just as you said, uh, the civil rights movement was able to actually bridge um, the color line in, in this country in a very particular way that had never been done before, especially after Jim Crow. And um, I think just as how the Civil War, you know, and, and its aftermath unified, reunified the country, so again, then you had Jim Crow, but then the Civil Rights Movement, it again unified America, I think, black and white, and across, you know, especially like the working class. And obviously, I think as to your, as to your uh, question as to whether it was a success or a failure, I would instead say that it's unfinished. Um, it didn't fail, it was just unfinished because it was put down very uh, aggressively by the FBI and by the state. Um, its leadership was all assassinated. Um, but I think the civil rights movement is something that lives in the consciousness of the American people very concretely. And it's... It's, I think it is something that has to be completed. It, it didn't fail because it was on track to do, I think, yeah, it was, it was on track to do a lot. I mean, the other big thing about it was that it was in conversation, it was in dialectic with so many freedom movements around the world. It was in close dialectic with, and I mean, in close conversation, like ideological exchange with, like the Indian independence movement, um, you know, with, with like the USSR, with so many like national liberation movements and, de and you know decolonial movements around the world, and it really I think despite the McCarthyism and all these kinds of anti-communism that was happening at the time, it really brought the people, the American people, I think into the fold, and in conversation with the rest of you know working and oppressed people around the world. Um, is I guess that's that's what I would say. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then I have a question for the second panelist. Um, so I, I was so I also wanted to ask you sort of the same type of question. Um, so like, what were the what were the goals of the Cuban Revolution, and then would you consider those goals to be sufficiently realized, like mm -hmm. in the aftermath? And then um, finally, like, maybe was it a success or? But I guess you can probably answer that. It's a good question. Um, uh, yes, the Cuban Revolution was successful because it overturned capitalism as a system in 1959. It was a movement that was led by Fidel Castro, the July 26 movement, the rebel army, that uh, overthrew a dictatorship that was backed by the United States, Batista. Um, and began to organize a country uh, through measures that, that 
drew on the involvement of the people of Cuba to take on the challenges of rebuilding a society. They carried out a land reform. They carried out measures. They nationalized industry. The defining act of the Cuban Revolution was a land reform, which was when the United States decided this cannot happen 90 miles from the U.S. border. Okay? And they attempted to overturn the revolution. But the, they, they continued to, to underestimate and they underestimate the Cuban people because of their leadership and the measures and what was involved. When you talk about mobilizing people to take on racist discrimination, women's oppression, you got to look at what the Cubans did. What did they do concretely to take on the, the divisions that were perpetuated uh, in Havana before they took power? But what they realized was the only way to address it was to take power, was to take political power. They took state power. They, there's a workers and farmers government that live, exists in Cuba today with all the, the complexities and challenges. The United States wants to smash it. They want to overturn the Cuban Revolution. And they have been tightening the embargo and they're making it harder for the Cuban people to survive. Was it successful? Yes. Will it continue to survive? I don't know. They need, they need revolutions in the world. They need other revolutions. That's what they need. There isn't enough to happening today to give them breathing room to, to do this. Okay, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, and and uh, the restrictions that the, the U.S. government has and the embargo has to be lifted. And we can become a part of doing that and demanding that. That's important. Was it successful? Yes. I believe it was. Uh, is it complete? No. It's a revolution. It continues, uh, and it continues to fight, and they continue to act in the interests of the oppressed and exploited the world over. The United States hates Cuba, but you go to any other part of the world, Cuba is revered. Why? Because of what they have done. What they did to overturn apartheid in South Africa. A very concrete example of how to fight racism. You want to talk about how to fight racism? Yeah. Look at what the Cubans did. They mobilized to go into Africa, this little small island right here, right, sent over two decades, on, almost 200,000 Cubans to fight in Angola, in Africa, because they realized that the only way to overturn apartheid was to cut off its hands, right? And that's what they organized to do. It wasn't just military, they organized to build the country, the economy, they, they, but most importantly, they understood why they were doing it. And if you want to talk about a, a higher moral values and the values of a different type of society, you've got to look at the transformation of the Cuban people as an example. But it's not the only one. It's, you see it happening in struggles today. When workers go into a fight, right, they break down the individualism that capitalism it's a doggy dog survival of the fittest. That's what this system is about. But once you enter into a fight, into a fight, right, you start to see that, hey, you don't realize what you can do when you stand together. You go into it and you come out of it completely changed. You look at the world differently, you look at the person next to you differently because you were involved in a struggle. To ask, answer your question, it's really interesting to look at what, like, during the civil rights movement, right, and the Montgomery bus boycott, these were workers who would walk to work and walk back at home and then go to a mass meeting, tired as they were after working, walking, because they wanted to be involved. All the other stuff falls away. I'm not, you know, you, you start to look for a different way. You start to see, you're inspired. You're inspired by a movement that you were part of. That's what you will begin to see when there's a mass movement. People get changed. You start to think about it differently. Okay? Um, anyway, so that's my take on that. <coughs> um. Oh, sorry. I was thinking about something you said. Um, you said, you know, uh, Marxism and, and this whole question, like, you know, how, how does somebody reach for theory? Well, somebody had asked Che Guevara, 
the question is your revolution Marxist in 1959, well, I don't know, one of these things. And he said, well, um, through our experience, we discovered the road pointed to by Marx. I think that's a very apt description because it's about your experiences that you go through not necessarily determined by what it is you're studying, whether it's Marxism or whatever, but you discover something, you know, and, and it makes sense. And that's what the Cuban people recognized. Through their activity, through their involvement, they recognized the socialist character of the revolution and its Marxist leadership. That's what they have today in Cuba that still exists, which is why they were so determined, determined to, to crush it. Right here? Um, yeah, so um, I think the um, question I have on my mind, I think part of it's been brought up before, like why is it that people have so much trouble organizing in certain ways? And you've talked about sort of a crisis of leadership, I think you said, in the world. Um, I would ask you, what, what is our litmus test as working people? Obviously, there's litmus tests that have been imposed upon us to determine what is good leadership. And, and to me, uh, just, just to give a couple examples in my own mind, is like how well is leadership able to identify and succeed in producing the, the goals and results of working people? And also, what are their ideas? Do their ideas further the unity of people? Um, and so, you know, I think of also this question of imperialism because I think, you know, as much as we talk about how capitalism has these internal contradictions and they're inevitably going to be working in a certain way. Um, you know, I think one of the insights of Lenin was to describe how imperialism was able to, to extricate or, or externalize these internal contradictions. And so in a way it's become this, this going to war to solve its own problems has been in a way I think the greatest wedge that the ruling class has ever had to dividing working people from leadership that might be able to identify this. And so, you know, I, I look around the world, I see Vladimir Putin in Russia, I see Xi Jinping in China, you know, I see Donald Trump in America, all asking mm -hmm. the question is, what is democracy? What is liberal democracy? Do we have democracy? Perhaps there's other kinds of democracy. Um, you know, I, I, I see the uh, anti-poverty campaign in China, you know, as, as a means to root out corruption, because what is poverty but the result of corruption? Um, you know, and of course, we all have our own, they, they have their own particular issues as well, but you brought up Cuba and how Cuba's been able to withstand this pressure. Well, they haven't done it alone. They've had an immense support from both Russia and China to, to sustain themselves through this. So we can't, part of the reason that these things are so helpful to see and these linkages to see is because we are a global community and we do have allies. And I do think part of uh, recognizing uh, true leadership for working people is being able to go across the island, being able to make amends with people who can help you uh, achieve your own independence, achieve your own sovereignty in these certain things. So my guess is, that, again, my question is like, what is our barometer for determining when we are actually seeing real leadership emerge? And what is the litmus test that we need to see in order to, to understand that? Mm -hmm. uh, directed at all panelists. I could comment about, about Cuba. I, I, I disagree with the idea that, that Cuba is, 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 is been, uh, under, uh, under Fidel and Che has been this, this wondrous success. Um, um, I, I think there, I, I admire Fidel and, and, and Che and I admire the Cuban Revolution. Um, but you know, when I, when, I, when I see you know, Marxism put into practice in the 20th century, uh, you know, I see, I see the, the, the emergence of these centralized uh, oppressive states like the Soviet Union and the like, right? And, 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 and then I think about Marx, and, and, and I don't think that's what, this is what Marx would have envisioned. And certainly, I wouldn't want to live in the Soviet Union or, or in Cuba after, after it's got a, you got a, a 
the, 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 the dictatorial power, right? I think the idea of, of having a revolution into, 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 into eliminating the private ownership over the means of production, I think is, is centrally, it's important, and I think is vital. But I think, when, I think one of the, the, the limitations of, of Marxist scholarship is, is envisioning, you know, conceptually, what the world's gonna look like after that, right? And I, I tend to favor the, the anarcho-Marxists, right? You know, I, I think of an, uh, uh, a debate between Bakunin and Marx, right? You know, Marx, you know, in, in, in the 19th century, there were anarchists running around, in the early 1900s, there were uh, anarcho Marxists running around, right? And, 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 and they were Marxists who, who reject the, this, this, this totalitarian kind of, of systems, right? And I kind of favor those kind of ideas, right? Uh, the question is, what, what would a society look like under that, right? And, and, and I think that's where the debate should be happening amongst Marxists today about how do we organize a society, you know, with a, a, a post-capitalist society, right, uh, that, that doesn't end up in, in, in an oppressive nightmare, right? Uh, which I would consider the Soviet Union, right? And, and, and I think it's possible, I, but I think it, it, it requires much more discussion, right, about, about you know, how, how we'd organize this, right? right? You know, that, that, that's my take on this, right? So don't, don't anybody, don't throw things at me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. Oh. Um, yeah, Anna, go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, I think in a certain way you kind of answered your own question, <laughs> but um, I guess just to elaborate on that, um, you, actually, what you said kind of reminded me of this one quote from Fidel Castro. He, I think he was um, going to New York, uh, New York City to the United Nations, and a reporter came up to him and asked him, are you wearing a bulletproof vest, right, because he's stepping into, quote, enemy territory. And he answered the question saying, no, I will land in New York like this. I have moral armor, mm -hmm. right? Um, he, and, you know, he was... Yeah, and something else, like, I kind of drew a connection in my mind, because what he's, what he's saying was that he had the legitimacy of his people. You know, he has, he already has a sense of morality. He, he does, you know, that's what his, um, he's passed that litmus test, I guess, to put it in those words, as a leader. And it kind of reminded me of something that Trump said back in, like, 2019, uh, actually, I forget, maybe 2016. And... He said to a reporter, he said, I could shoot someone in the middle of like New York City and like everybody would still vote for me. Um, now, I'm not saying that, like, I, that these two people are equivalent, in, but, but what I am saying is that, like speaking specifically to your question, is a leader is worth being taken seriously and being studied if they have the support of the people in this way. Now, again, Trump, it's, with, with, in the case of Trump, it's one section of the American people, but what is it, like, 70 plus million people turned out to vote for him, I'm sure there are even more who support him and didn't vote for him explicitly. That's worth being taken seriously. And I think, as you said, it's worth exploring what about their personality or their character or their platform is it that people are so working people are so attracted to. And I think with the case of Trump, he is actually asking certain fundamental questions about the state of US democracy. Is it, are we actually the, de the democracy that we say we are? Are we actually upholding our social contract you know, to the people? I mean, obviously the answer is no. Um, and that's a question he raised that I don't think any of his uh, political uh, opponents have raised. So I guess that's what, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, well, it, when you say uh, what's the measure of leadership uh, and what kind of leadership? Because it's, leadership is, is how it, it's not a, a, I guess, a classless term because you got bourgeois leaders, right? Trump is a capitalist politician who was very calculated about how he spoke to working people in the election. He was very, he was the only one that talked about the carnage. He talked about the conditions in any way. Was he going to address it in the interest of working people? No, not at all. But he was, he was, it was a, a tactic. But he's a capitalist politician. 
Is there anything there for working people? No. What's the history of the working class movement and the leadership that has evolved? That's something you got to go and look through. Because that's the kind of leadership we want, we need, that we, the working class deserves. You look at the leaders of revolutionary movements and struggles. That's where you start. That's your barometer of who, you, who are you talking about. You're talking about individuals that led mass movements. You're talking about Thomas Sankara, Malcolm X. You're talking about Fidel Castro, the July 26th movement, Maurice Bishop. Uh, those who, who drew on the continuity of, of, of working, the working class movement and, and, and tried to lead it, make it concrete today, which is what Marxism is. It's not a set of ideas. It's the history of the working class as it fights for its emancipation and the lessons that are drawn over time. That's what, that's what you need. That's what you need in order to understand how to make a revolution you got to look at revolutionary struggles. Why the Soviet Union is the complete opposite of what happened in Cuba. The counter-revolution that was led in, in, in the Soviet Union under Stalin is not what exists in Cuba today. You have a different leadership that was conscious of how to, to confront what was happening in the Soviet Union that was different. They knew from their experience there was something terribly wrong in the Soviet Union. That's why it never fell like the rest of these regimes when they collapsed in 91. Cuba still continues to survive. There's a, different, there's a big difference. What is it based on? Well, it's not luck, I tell you that. It's consciousness, it's, it's, it's because they, they organized to lead a revolution in a different way that, showed, that drew on, on, on the broadest possible participation and involvement that showed a change that became consciousness that was changed. That's, that's what is different. And to how do you push back the hand of the bureaucracy? And that's the experiences of the Cuban Revolution as worth going into, which I'm not going to try and summarize. But that's what makes it different. Uh, Tony? Well, uh, I've been showing this panel. Um, I think the U.S. working people are more politicized today than we have been in decades. Highly politicized. Uh, and uh, the politicization has to be understood. I mean, we cannot stand back from all of these things going on and say, well, uh, these are reactionaries, white supremacists, homophobes, and fascists. Uh, of course, they're being labeled this by the people who are really fascist and who have supported fascism in many different forms around the world uh, for a long time. But, you know, um, I, would, I would characterize myself these days as optimistic. I see many political opportunities and possibilities for revolutionaries who also understand the nature of the democratic struggle. That's what Marx and Engels understood. That's what Lenin understood. Peace, uh, bread, and land. Uh, and that was, these were democratic demands. Uh, and so it is now with us in this unique moment here. I agree with, um, agree with Anna very much. We are in a unique moment in the history of the United States. And I think the only way we'll understand that is by understanding something about the history of the US people. Uh, and we have to understand that period from, let us say, 1955 to 1975, uh, broadly called the Civil Rights Movement, uh, more particularly by its participants called the Black Freedom Movement, which was to free the nation. To free the nation. And that gives us a profound resource to build upon. But having said that, 
I think we, I, I just like to put to the panel, how do y'all deal with the question of war and peace, given that the Biden administration has brought us closer to nuclear war than we've ever been? Uh, apparently, there's a deep opposition to this among the American people, crystallized most, most strongly in that part of the Republican Party known as uh, by some as uh, the Putin wing or the populist wing of the Republican Party. Uh, how do we understand this in terms of the politicization of the working class of this country and what opportunities does this situation present for us uh, as revolutionaries, for the people, for the trade union movement. Uh, of course, the fight for democracy is, in part, the fight for the right to organize and to strike. You shut down a strike, you're shutting down a fundamental democratic right of hundreds of thousands of workers. Uh, so I'd like to, to put that question of war and peace on the table. How do we bring that in to the democratic struggle of working people. Uh, how are work, to our best of our uh, ability, how do we uh, see this uh, threat of nuclear war coming from the Biden administration? How do, do we know how the working people are responding to this? And I guess, I guess the last question, since you can't talk about politics in the United States without talking about Donald Trump. And not Donald Trump the individual, but Donald Trump who is the representative of a movement of tens of millions of people. I was talking to Danny about this uh, the other night. Suppose Trump decides to run as an independent in 2024. What do we do? Do we run to the side as many, inverted quotation marks, leftists have done to the side of the most uh, bellicose war uh, elements, but they're not fascists, right? I, I don't know what fascism they're talking about. But I'd like to know, suppose Donald Trump runs as an independent. Uh, what would be our take? And again, uh, how does this relate to the question of war and peace? Um, Directed all panels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anna, Beth. You want to go? Yeah, I'll go. Um, I, I think uh, the it's important for working people to support the fight for Ukrainian independence. Um, because this is the heart of the question. It's not the Biden administration that's threatened the use of nuclear weapons. It's the Putin regime. No. Um, and That's it's not, not true. Well, let, okay. I, I think so I let, have the okay. floor. Elaborate. I think no, too. Yes, 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 please. No, 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 no. Let me just say, I okay. just, shouldn't we have some uh, floor in terms of what is accurate? You say that the Putin administration is, has, well, maybe if I'm boring, but you say the Putin administration is the provocateur of nu the use of nuclear weapons? Absolutely. And what evidence do you have of that? It's what he said. When? All right. No, 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 Ethan, no, 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 no. I, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not undermining discussion. I just ask him, should not, okay, you just, go, okay. I, I go you know, ahead. there's, go, go ahead, he has, go he's ahead. elaborating on it, you know, go ahead, go ahead, go sure. Ahead, Okay, we have a disagreement, which is... Yeah, I'm just, I just want to... There's nothing wrong with us making it clear. I mean, mm -hmm. I deeply disagree with... But go ahead, man. Well, we start with supporting the, the fight. We call for the defeat of the, the Russian invasion. We support the right of the Ukrainian people to defend themselves, their sovereignty, their independence. This is the struggle that they are waging. Okay? How they how they, and kind of support that they are able to muster, well, however they do it, to arm themselves, to defend themselves. That's what they are facing today. It is a brutal onslaught. 
by the Russian army, by the Russian government. But you don't see it as a proxy war and that yeah. the war is against NATO? It's and not the... Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to... But you know, but go ahead, I mean... Okay, I mean, that's, that's how I... That's what I think is the way to look at what is happening. It's not because of the expansion of NATO that Putin invaded Ukraine. That's not what, why. He's determined to become the next Tsar and, and smash Ukraine into dust and create another Tsar. That's his motivation. He can stop this. He can, but he's not going to. Okay, so what do the Ukrainian people do? What would you do if you were in Ukraine? In what part of Ukraine? Yeah. If I'm in the Donbass, yeah. what would you, yeah? What would yeah. you do? Sixteen thousand died from shelling from the. West I I understand, but if you don't fight, which is why they 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 continue to win support because they courageously are fighting. They trying to they trying to resist. I think you're making a serious mistake. Well, they, uh, that's fine. That's that's fine. I, I I'm for the Ukrainian people to to determine their own. Western. I, let, let I think part we I can elaborate on. Sure, sure. I, you know, I disagree with a lot of the earlier stuff that you said, but I completely agree with you what you said here about Ukraine. I, 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 ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, Putin, Putin invaded, you know, the Ukraine partly because of cultural, you know, identity reasons. Like, you know, Ukraine is historically the origins of the Russian people. This is in, this is the ultra nationalist in Russia. They think of Ukraine as the, the birthplace of Russia, right? And, and then you got the, you know. The, the NATO thing, right? You got the, you know, the, Putin's f concerned about Ukraine becoming, you know, part of NATO and, 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 and weapons, right? But you know, but but neither of those seems to me to be much, much, much foundational sense because, you know, you know, the the, the, the Baltic part republics are already on the border and they could, you know, if they want, they could put their weapons there, right? And and, and so it, does, it doesn't seem to me to be a foundational, a legitimate, or plausible for for Putin to to argue, you know, whatever he's arguing. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, he, he wants to take over the, the, the eastern regions because it's Russian majority population, and that's true. But but you know, he, he's violating I internationally agreed upon uh, um, territorial boundaries. You know, when when Ukraine got established, right? And, and so that's it's it's not a question of, of, of Marxism or anything else. It's a question of, of, of uh, you know of practical yeah. politics and, and justice. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, I, I, can I just try to frame these questions? Yes. Because, wait, I'm, I'm going to I'm just do it in moderation. We yes. should come back. Yes, this right. is, I'm, I'm trying to draw this back. Right. I'm, I'm very happy yes. about the enthusiasm. And th yeah. This is why it's good to have these conversations. And we haven't thrown fists yet. And <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the question that seemed to come from Tony was kind of almost in terms of us in America, I mean, whatever the cause of the war, it still is a question about what is the kind of a labor movement to do towards it. Whether or not it was caused from one side or the other, it seemed to be at the level of like the politics. That's how I understood Tony's question about what is your stance on war and peace? Because maybe like that, maybe that's another good panel. We should have that. I'm <laughs> glad everybody suggested that. But for the politics of work tonight, kind of, right, it right. seemed to be what is the relationship of war and peace yeah. to the labor movement. Sure, and, yeah. And to the politicization the of, the working people of the working class. Of the yes. Sure. Can I just, just briefly, I mean, it's not a hostile thing. I think if we left here tonight with the view that the United States is fighting a proxy war that is a defensive war against aggression, if we left here tonight thinking that way, we would make a huge mistake, which would be a profound setback to what I consider to be the politicization of working people of this country. And part of that politicization is the growing opposition to the U.S. war in Ukraine and the fact that this budget that was just mm -hmm. passed in secret of night 1.7 trillion dollars with over 800 billion of it going for military, 700 billion to domestic stuff. I mean, we have, I think we have um, crossed uh, that red line in our own politics where we're looking at perhaps the most dangerous war administration 
maybe in the history of the United States. And we just can't dis dismiss that if we're talking about the politics of work. The politicization of labor. That's all yeah. I wanted to say. Okay. So directed. Anyone want to pick up? Oh, well, I mean, from what I've seen, I'm just going to say that the this this Russia Ukraine conflict the way that its public opinion in the United States has fallen I mean I, I think it's pretty interesting to look at the demographics of who is on the side of Russia and who is on the side of the Ukrainian government under Zelensky um, I would say that I mean just in pen circles and also among like the Ukrainian American community which comes from a very uh, specific like stratum of the Ukrainian population. Yeah, they're, they support the Zelensky government. Um, but actually, like a, a lot of working Americans either are indifferent or they support Russia. Um, because they see that the war is unnecessary um, and that it was provoked and is continuing to be funded and supported by the Biden administration while you know this country's own institutions for its own people continue to crumble and continue to massively fail its people. Um, I mean, I think the American people generally, especially working people, are war weary. Um, they, I mean, you had Vietnam, you had Iraq. I mean, I have many members of my family who uh, have been in the military and I mean, I have a cousin who came back from Iraq with horrific PTSD. He's you know, he, I mean, he's, I mean, I mean, he speaks for millions of Americans who I think are actually very anti-war. Um, so, I guess what I would also say then is that to be, I'm trying to think how to put this. You have to look at who's supporting what. You have to look at the position of the media, for example, the corporate media. If you disagree with them on almost everything else that they say about whether it be about Trump, whether it be about workers, then why is it that all of a sudden they're right about Russia and Ukraine? Um, could, just really brief comment, just like one sentence. Did she, she I think it's important to say is that how is it a government that at home doesn't care about its own citizens, as evidenced by this panel, cares so much about the citizens yeah. of another country. I think that in itself is reason to be suspicious of the narrative in the US. Whether it's the Wall Street Journal, whether it's the New York Times, whether it's all of these news medias who are portraying this narrative of the war. And I think there are a lot of details that we might not be able to flesh out in this particular discussion. But I think that framework that Anna is laying out does give us more reason to actually contest the, the narrative and the facts. Yeah, let me just say one thing. If there's no reason, we, there's no way that the United States is fighting a war in the interests of the Ukrainian people. They have never fought a war to support any struggle of the oppressed and exploited ever. Now, and they're not doing it now either, okay? So let's, this is a class divided society. They don't act in the interests of working people here any more than they do in Ukraine. They don't care about the Ukrainian people at all. But what you gotta look at though is there is a just struggle by the Ukrainian people that is unfolding right now. They are, they are trying to fight. They are trying to fight. Is Zelensky is a capitalist, part of a capitalist government in Ukraine. In fact, they've been using the war to, to bit by bit, right? Take actions against workers organizing, unions, banning organizations, uh, Things like that. So the working people in Ukraine, right, are, are, are facing it on two fronts. So, yeah, 
They're trying to get whatever weapons they can to defend themselves. Do we have an opinion of how they do it? I don't think you can. You can't impose that on somebody who's fighting for their existence to figure out how and where they're getting it. But they are fighting. And that's what you got to see. Okay? Because the... Yes, this is how I see it. The Russian government is invading Ukraine. That's, that's the fight. Okay, so what are the positions that working people take on war and peace? Well, I think the Russian Revolution is a good example of what they did to... What is the way that you, that you fight for peace? Well, you have to understand who the war makers are and you have to take the ability to take, make war from their hands. And that's the US imperialists. Yes, they are all using the Ukraine the alignment of forces that came out of World War II is being transformed entirely in the world today. They are all arming up. Germany that was relying on the protection of the United States, not anymore. They increased their budgets. Japan, same thing. Yes, the tendency towards imperialist rivalry and war is far greater and the fear of nuclear conflagration is very real. It's going to, it could happen, yes. I agree, but what do we do? What do we do? We fight for our own foreign policy. We fight for an independent working class road. A party that's based on labor, that can fight in the interests of working people, that can support the struggles of the Ukrainian people for their freedom. That would be a pretty advanced thing to take up, wouldn't it? For a labor movement that's fighting for its interests of to see that we have common interests as working people. Anyway, that's how I would see it. That's how we see the world transforming its class contradictions. And to unravel them and see what's in the interests of working people is how you start to see the world. Um, I just want to check really quick if there are any more questions. And if not, we can sort of raise uh, this last question of war and the relationship to the politics of labor as sort of uh, uh, alongside concluding remarks. Um, so, John, alongside concluding remarks, I said. I don't know. <laughs> um, John? Just concluding remarks, is that what you're Sure. Doing? Yeah. Um, you know, after hearing everything that's been said today, you know, uh, uh, I, I would just hope that that, 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 that that people loosen their ideological straitjackets, right? Um, 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 uh, the world is a complex place, you know, and, 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 and again, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, as I've said several times, you know, I, I, I subscribe to the fundamentals of Marx's ideas, right? Um, but but, but if, when you look at around the world and, and you, just, uh, you, you just sort of you force fit the realities of, 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 of you know, force fit this ideological apparatus into into the, 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 rea the realities, you know, I, I get a little concerned. I, I, I think of Gramsci, you know, Gramsci once said, you know, I, you know, you know we, we shouldn't think of Marx as God, basically, right? You know, to like, you know and, I, and I, I agree with him, right? It's, you know, Marx can, comes up with a good theory, but it's not, it's not the Bible, right? And, and, I, and I would just hope that, that people, you know, uh, you know, critically reflect upon, upon the ideas, that, that the important ideas that Marx has given us, right? And that's all I have to say. Uh, with the last two. Anyone else want to raise any further concluding remarks? Or? I'm trying to think. <laughs> okay. Uh, you got to give me a minute. Sure. Uh, yeah, you want to go? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'll go. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, th this is a very useful exchange. I appreciate the opportunity to being invited to speak. Um, and I hope there's more discussions like this uh, where we can come together and talk about what it is that we are confronting today and how to more effectively fight against it. Uh, we don't have to agree on everything. This, this is correct. Um, but I would also add that I strongly believe that the working class uh, is going to make history. Uh, and it is the fear that the ruling class has of working people around the world that is driving their attacks and assaults on us today. 
because they don't have a solution but to do the same and it will continue and they will use their forms to try and prevent us from organizing in our interests as a class and the fight for state power which I believe ultimately is what we need to do is make a revolution in this country Um, yeah, I also want to thank the organizers for just putting this together. Um, yeah, I guess as for concluding remarks, <laughs> I mean, I'm not really sure what more to say aside from that I think, yes, well, history is currently being made. And I think we would all, I mean, we, just everybody would do well to pay attention to what and who are really, I think, the progressive forces of making history in this country. I don't, I, I really would say that it's not the people that we think it is. Um, I think, mm, yeah, I guess, I, I guess the other thing I would say is that, I mean, I really do see a future and the really just the, the revolutionary capacity of the American people um, as they are and also as for who they can be um, and that they are inheritors of the great revolutionary history of this country and of course you know there's going to be a lot of relationships with yeah revolutions that have happened in recent history and um, of what's existing today. And I guess finally that what I really walk away with is that I think one of the most fundamental contradictions that we're dealing with right now is I don't know about the working class as many people have it um, maybe classically defined, you know, whether it's them versus the capitalist class, but rather who are the war makers and who are the peacemakers? I think the fundamental contradiction that we really have to confront here is one of war versus peace, or put in other words, of empire versus humanity. And when you really shake it, who's gonna fall on which side? Um, yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for the as well. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, so this panel is organized by the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, for y'all who don't know, uh, we're a campus-based international organization. We organize public fora like these, uh, you know, bringing together figures on the left to discuss similar topics to this. Um, we also have at Penn a, um, an ongoing coffee break series discussing like more specific topics on the left uh, on Sundays. Uh, as well as we'll be restarting our um, Introduction to Revolutionary Marxism reading group. Um, so if uh, you're in Philadelphia and you'd be interested in getting involved, uh, we have uh, our publication in the back, as well as a uh, QR code to join our newsletter. Um, and yeah, so thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to the panelists for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you.